everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. We're really excited to see you here. And yes, as Chelsea said, I, I was looking forward to getting all 500 or 600 that wanted to get in because uh, part of uh, what really gets us all excited here at Google and within the Bazel team is uh, getting uh, a bigger community involvement. Uh, this is an open source product, so we would love for all of you to know what it is, try it, use it, learn. Uh, and by the way, we have a table at the end uh, there uh, after the talks, should you have questions or would you like to join uh, our user group that we can do more regular meetups about specific uh, questions on Bazel, feel free to stop by that table. Uh, so I'm Helen Altschuler and uh, I'm fairly new at Google, just joined five months ago um, and Prior to Google, I was the CTO of a fintech a startup called PRIQ and also spent most of my career at JP Morgan as a software engineer and afterwards as an executive director for the risk technology and big data anal analytics teams. But today, uh, we'll talk about uh, our, our experience here. For me, what's, what's been really uh, interesting and unique um, to notice about Google during my first uh, few months was that there's a huge focus on developer efficiency, productivity, and happiness. And uh, not the fake focus that I've seen in, in prior places where it's more about scorecards and uh, metrics and dates, but more about tools. And tools built by engineers for engineers to make them love what they do and more efficient in the best uh, type of technologies that they're working at. And that's really what, uh, what makes, makes this company unique. And, uh, uh, Today, we want to talk to you and share that experience that the company has built over the past 10 years about making its build system available for everyone. So, uh, so why would you care? Uh, well, first of all, we'll tell you a little bit more about why we care. Uh, and that's because Google uh, has, obviously, a big scale to deal with. So we've got two, 2 billion lines of code uh, across 9 million files. We've got uh, um, 25,000 engineers. That was at the end of, at some point, at last year. Now it's uh, growing a lot more than that. And uh, something around 45,000 changes per day. And uh, about a third of those changes are actually uh, by engineers. And uh, two thirds are automated changes by our uh, automated packaging tools. But uh, uh, certainly, from uh, compare, for comparison, we, uh, we looked at some of the uh, published data and uh, MS Windows uh, overall is about 50 million lines of code. So uh, we are dealing with a tremendous scale. And when you have tremendous scale, you need your systems to be efficient and fast. Um, so for you, why should you care uh, about build a, a build system? So you need one when your team is more than two to three software engineers, and also when you use one uh, or more, well, really more uh, than one programming language, because at that scale, it's becoming more apparent that you need some structure and some effectiveness. Uh, you can't just rely on linking everything by yourself. Uh, and of course, Google has been doing this for 10 years, and it helped us grow, and it scaled really well. And now with the open source development of Bazel, which was released uh, last year, you can all take advantage of this. And it is a tool that's uh, platform independent. It works on-prem or on any cloud platform, uh, and it has a lot more flexibility. Um, so for those of you, uh, so actually, be, before we get, we, we get to, to talk about the build system, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the audience. Uh, so how many of you are software engineers? OK, but a pretty big group here. Uh, product managers, smaller. Entrepreneurs, startups. Uh, OK, so, so, we, so we, we've got a pre pretty, pretty uh, good group here of people that care about building and releasing software and making uh, changes uh, and uh, developing products. So, but for those of you who are not familiar with the build system, so build system is basically a software that helps you build your software. It's a, it's a more structural tool that allows you to translate between uh, machine code and your source code. It also allows you to create and understand the dependencies so you don't have to manually inspect different kinds of files and figure out what order your different uh, types of sources need to, to, to be working in. Um, so there are multiple build tools out there. Many of you may have heard or used the Make, Maven. Uh, there, there, there's, there's, there's tools available for almost every language, Gradle, uh, and, uh, and, and lots of other ones. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about Bazel and uh, what is Bazel, how it works, the, its real internals. Uh, and that's what Ulf is going to tell us about. Oops. I think it
Thanks. I'm off. Um, first of all, thanks for coming here. Um, I'm the tech lead for Basil, or one of the tech leads, to be correct. Uh, I've been with the team for seven and a half years. Uh, there is basically no one who has been here for longer than me. Um, and I, I do a lot of technical stuff. I, I'm, I'm an engineer by heart. Uh, I now also manage uh, the, the, the Munich team, the Munich part of the team. We're in two sites. We're both in New York and Munich. Um, and so we're doing a lot. All right. That was the wrong direction. Where are we? <laughs> OK. All right, so, so what's special about Basil? Uh, and why do we even have our own build system? Um, and how is Basil different? All right, let's, let's look again at the challenge that we have. You know, Google, at some point in our history, we decided to keep all of the source code in a single repository. And I don't want to talk about why we do that, but about what's involved with doing that. Um, and so what does that actually look like? Um, if you have two million lines of two billion lines of code. Now, if you think of Google, you think of Google Search, maybe, or of Gmail. So maybe you can think of some things that these, that these services do. What does Google Search do? What does Gmail do? Anyone? Search and email. Search and email. Excellent. <laughs> what else do these things do? Index. Index, yes. Profile. Profile. What? <laughs> All right. Ads. Ads, show ads. OK. Um, all right, so, so you have Google Mail, and then parses email, and, and speaks SMTP, and sends email, and handles email. And you have Google Search, which crawls a lot of web pages, and has a huge search index. And then you have login. And it, it turns out Google Search needs login as well. right? Uh, Google Search gives you a better experience if you log in, and can, is able to, to search all your private data as well. And now, you know, coming back to the big code base, um, there are libraries that do this, right? It's not a single big binary, a single big you know, thing that we just put in our data center, but it's actually more like a collection of microservices, of services and microservices, and, and then in turn, a collection of libraries, right? So we have libraries for everything. Uh, and a lot of these libraries are shared between services. Not all of them, but many of them. So there is really a lot of structure in the code base. And Basil uses this structure to run the build. And the structure is explicit in the Basil configuration files. Um, let's, take, let's take a look at an example. Uh, so this is an, well, a made up example. But this is what it would actually, could actually look like. Right? You have a build file. You have a Java binary rule in it. I, do a lot of Java work, so that's what I've used for an example. Uh, but it could be anything, really. Um, then you have a couple of source files. In this case, we actually look for all the source files in the current directory. And you have dependencies, and you have a main class. And then you know, your Java file looks like this. So what does Basil do with that? All right. So it looks at the build file, it loads it, and it says, this is a package. And this package contains one rule. And it also contains one source file, and it contains a generated file, the source, the output file of the Java binary. And there is nothing else in this package. So Basil doesn't actually go out and look for all the source files that you have in your tree, but it only looks at the build files um, and maybe you know, list a directory or so. And the, the key idea here is that uh, if you have such a big code base, you need to make sure that you can make sense of the code base very quickly and efficiently. So you only want to read the parts of the code base that are actually needed for your build. Um, if you compare that with make, for example, um, make reads the entire make file. And knows every, if, the, if you have a single make file for your project, make, at the end of reading the make file, make knows everything, which is great, except if your code base goes beyond a certain size, you need to start having just reading the make file can start to take minutes. 
That's actually what we had. We were using Make before we started using Bazel, Bazel um, and it took a long time. And so this is one of the things that we definitely wanted to do. And so um, one key attribute here is that we also know about all the dependencies of this rule. So the rule depends on the source files, um, and it also de depends on you know the dependencies declared here. In this case, it's bar. Uh, and then the rule itself, the Java binary, also depends on tools, like the Java compiler and Java packaging tools, you know, that sort of thing. But there is no other dependency. There is no implicit dependency on something else. We don't go out and try to figure out what you want to do, but rely on it everything being explicitly specified. So when we look at this build file, we know exactly what we need to do. We read this build file, we read the build file for the tools, for the dependencies, and then we start building. And so I want to give it sort of a walkthrough to, to how Bazel builds stuff. So you tell Bazel, please build foo. All right, so Bazel starts with that. Now in order to build foo, it needs to read the build file for foo. Um, okay, um, let's do that. And then it needs to list the, direct, list the directory, right, to find the other source files in this case. Okay, uh, so now we have the, the package, we know what it is. Okay, we know that there's a dependency on bar, so it reads the bar build file as well. Uh, in this case, there isn't a glob. Someone said explicitly, you know, this depends on bar.java. In this case, Bazel doesn't go out and, and look for files. All right, so we've got the rule now. We know what it is. We've analyzed its dependencies. Now we want to build it. So we sort of go back up to that, that first node and say, okay, now I want to build it. So what do I need to do to build it? All right, I need to do a packaging step. All right, that's the last step in the process. And this packaging step depends on having compiled the files. So we see that, that we now have this dependency on the compiler, um, and then we start compiling the files in the right order. And then we're done. All right, so that's good. Um, now what happens if you modify a source file? Let's take a look at that. Modify foo main.java. And then Bazel knows, because it has tracked all those dependencies, exactly which actions it has to re-execute. It doesn't have to look at anything else. And so you can imagine that if your, if your software is small, you know, it doesn't really matter. But as your software gets bigger, it becomes more and more important that you only do the minimum amount of work absolutely necessary for whatever changes you've just made. Right? So I, for those who don't know it, most software developers you know, type text in a text editor or an IDE. Um, and, and you usually don't change everything at once. right? You change one file. You want to fix one bug. You want to add one feature. So you go to the right file and start editing it. And then you rebuild. And then you rebuild and rebuild. And you want to, maybe you want to run some tests on it. Or you want to run it on your computer. And so, so this, this cycle needs to be as fast as possible for you to be, as a software engineer, to be productive. All right, so let's take a look at the more complicated example, adding a file. Let's say we added a file. Uh, now, this, this foo node here with a slash at the end uh, that sort of represents the directory or the directory listing. Um, and we can figure out that the directory listing has changed. Um, on, on Linux systems, we use the inotify API for that, right? The Linux kernel has this API, which allows us to ask, you know, tell me all the files that have changed in this directory. You know, tell me every time something in this directory structure changes. Um, and so that fires when we add a file, and so we know that this directory listing is out of date. So we redo the directory listing, and we know exactly which actions have depended on that. Um, and then we reconstruct the package, we create the new, um, new actions, and then when we execute it, of course, we take the new file into account, and we're done. And again, we're doing the minimum amount of work necessary to update from you know, your change from the previous state you, plus your change to the, to the complete new change. And in any case, we've never looked at bar. We've never even considered the existence of bar. All right, so how do we make sure that this is correct? Uh, we need to know all the dependencies. We need to know exactly what all the dependencies are. Um, and then when we run an action, we need to make sure that you don't accidentally or intentionally access files that you didn't declare as a dependency. 
And so we use sandboxing on all the, all the major platforms to do that. And for us, uh, we've always seen that correctness equals performance. If we can ensure that the build system is sufficiently correct, that it gets this right 99.999% of the time, then our developers never need to do a clean. They never need to restart from scratch. They always get an incremental build, which is fast because we can make sure that we do just the minimum amount of work necessary. And so if you, if you look at our code base, you know, 45,000 changes per day is a lot, and we build everything after every change. Well, that's not true. What we actually do is we only build the stuff that was changed. Right? You change the mail parser, we only rebuild the mail server. Everything else we don't even touch. And so we can do that with that you know, number of changes because we do the minimum of, amount of change at each, at each step. All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about time and space complexity. And I hope that everyone will be able to follow, even though this is a bit technical. Um, let's, say we have, let's say we have a Java program. I'm sorry for, to, to everyone who, who doesn't write Java, but uh, it's my most used language. All right, so we have a, a sequence of libraries, library A, then library B depends on library A, library C depends on library B, and so on, up, up to our binary. And so for each of these, we have some source files that we want to compile. Um, and so in order to compile the source files, you need to know the dependencies. So when you compile A, you only compile A. Oh, that's easy. When you compile B, you, you need to make A available for the source files, for the compiler to be able to compile B. When you compile C, you need to make sort of the, the libraries A and B available. And now if you look at this, you know, the first library has one thing that it looks at, then two, then three, then four, then five. And if you sum that up, in general, one plus two plus three and so on plus n is n times n plus one over two, which is something something n squared. Um, and in terms of complexity, n squared is not that bad, except if you have a large code base. The larger your code base, the worse this gets. Not just, it, and, it's, and it's not just two times the size of the code base, it's two times worse, but it's actually four times worse. Um, and so this is a problem that we've been struggling with for, for, for years, um, and we've been working on this. I, it sounds weird if I say we work on this for years because it seems like a simple problem, but you need to apply this to every programming language you support. Um, and you need to make sure that you don't you know, we have hundreds of people contributing to the code base. We need to make sure that everyone is aware of this problem and that they follow the, the coding patterns that are needed to, to solve this. All right, so, so this is sort of the solution, right? Instead of storing, you know, making a copy of everything before, you just give a pointer to whatever was before here. We don't really care. It's just something. Um, and so that solves the space problem. But at some point, you actually run the compiler and you need to make all of this available. Um, you have to iterate eventually. All right, let's take another example. You don't have one binary, but you have many binaries. You have many tests, hopefully. Uh, everyone has a lot of tests? Yes? Okay. Um, and so, sorry. What, what can happen here is that um, at each of the tests, you iterate over all of your dependencies, and then if you have and n, n over two dependencies and n over two tests, you have n over two times n over two, and you get again into quadratic regime, um, which is again problematic. Um, so I wanted to give an example of how this can kill you, because it can, and it does. This is the C++ compiler. This is GCC. This is the performance of GCC. There is a specific case where the C++ compiler runs into a quadratic regime. And then this happens. The, the numbers on the left are seconds, right? So this is the time needed to compile a single C++ source file. And as you can see, it goes up like this if you do it wrong. The, if you do it right, it looks like the green line on the bottom. So 
So in Basel, we've been working on this. And these are sort of our times. This is not the full build. This is just what we call analysis. Uh, these are the, the lines for CC library and Java library and Pi library. The numbers are not quite up to date, but I checked that they're still you know, quite close. Um, right? As, this is on, on the bottom is the number of dependencies. Right? If you have 1,400 libraries in a row in your project, I don't think anyone will do that, not even us. But if you had, Basil would still be able to analyze that in under a second. Because we make sure that we don't grow quadratically, but only linearly in the number of dependencies. Build systems can't avoid this. There is no build system that can get around this. The only thing you can do is sort of try to push it a little more towards linear and away from quadratic. Um, now, for us, we don't just build stuff. Uh, you know, we have a data center worth of machines. We don't need a single machine. Let's just distribute it across the data center. And that helps us a lot because it, it, gets, it gives us a better factor, right? Let's say you have 100 machines. And you distribute your, your build across 100 machines, and your performance scales, scales quadratically, but you only have like 100 libraries. Um, then if you can do it right, you can parallelize all the compiles to them all in parallel um, and get much better performance, obviously. Uh, all right. So I've talked about Java, but what about binary lambda calculus? Anyone using that? I was looking for the most uh, unusual programming language I could find. No? OK. Uh, all right. What about Scala? Anyone using Scala here? All right. So, so when you have a build system, we do a lot of language-specific work. Right? At Google, we use like the major four languages, like Java and C++ and Go and uh, Python. Uh, but you know, if you want to use the build system, you might want to use a different language. You might want to use it for Scala or for Fortran or for Haskell. And we support that. We have an extension language that allows you to, to extend Bazel for any lang pretty much any language you can think of. Uh, we have literally dozens of examples uh, of languages that, that we can support with this extension mechanism. Um, it's, this, this extension mechanism is a little bit unusual. Uh, it doesn't allow you to freely program because we want to make sure that we can still know all of the dependencies that your software has and that we can do incremental builds correctly in all cases. So we've intentionally restricted this so that you can only do things that we can, that are safe, right? We can make sure that whatever you do, we can correctly do incremental builds in our cases, and also correctly parallelize your build. Um, this is a brief example. You know, I'm not going to go through this, but you can see that it's reasonably easy to add support for something in this case that runs shell commands, uh, right? So. In some cases, you, you have like a, a case where you have a file and you want to do something with it. And the easiest way you can think of is shell. Uh, and when that happens, you can use a general. All right. And then this is what your build file looks like. So it, it looks similar to what we had before. And this is an advantage, because it means that if you're, if you're a company and you have multiple people working on your projects, and maybe they work with different languages. You know, the build files all look very similar. And they're all similar in ways that make it easy to, to pick up you know, a different part of your project. We, we, we talk a lot to, to people who would like to use Bazel. And they often tell us, well, they are currently running with a combination of make and Maven and shell scripts and Gradle. And so, one of the advantages of Bazel is that it can handle pretty much all programming languages. I mean, not, maybe not literally all. I don't know. <laughs> we haven't tried all of them yet, uh, but a lot of them. And it makes it very easy to move bet between different parts of the project and between different languages. And we have Scala rules, actually, and Go rules and Rust rules. Um, and you can go to GitHub and see the full list of, of languages that we already have support for. All right, um, talked about that, talked about that. Workers, 
Now, workers are pretty cool. I want to talk about them because they're so cool. Um, so in some cases, you want your builds to be even faster. Uh, and now if you look at your compiler, your compiler has to do all sorts of things before it can even compile your code. It needs to load the standard library and initialize itself and so on and so forth. Um, and what we support is we support uh, keeping a, a process, a hot process around, a hot compiler process around, so that um, it can cache the, the standard library and other things in, in memory. Um, and then, especially for incremental builds, this is particularly interesting, because then we reduce the, the pass on incremental builds by, by quite a bit. We, of course, we have IDE integration. Not all of them yet, but we're working on that. And all right. So build systems. What's special about Bazel? Well, we try to make sure that we do the minimum amount of work necessary every time. And we make sure that we know all the dependencies that go into it so that we can do that correctly. Uh, we sandbox actions so that you can't accidentally uh, depend on something that you didn't declare. Um, in build systems, we believe that correctness is driving performance. Uh, we need to be very careful to avoid quadratic behavior. Otherwise, you end up like C++ compiler. Um, and we have an extension language. So you can support pretty much any, any language, any programming language you want. All right. Thank you. And over to David. Thank you. So there's a giant clock here screaming at me saying, dude, it's late. Everyone wants to get back uh, to drinking and, and eating. So in true Basil fashion, I will not repeat anything you've already heard. I will only tell you new information. Uh, my name is Dave. I'm the product manager for Bazel. I've been at Google for about three years. And prior to that, I worked with a lot of different teams, a lot of different tools and languages. And what really struck me when I came to Google was how productive and happy the engineers were. And, and of course, these are mutually reinforcing things. And the tools that they use is a really big part of what makes them so engaged. And one of them is called uh, Blaze which is Bazel is built on. So it's really exciting for me that we're able to take this and extend it to the community uh, and offer that productivity to everyone uh, across languages, across platforms. Bazel's a little funny as a, a new product, in a sense, because it's been around uh, for over 10 years uh, from the genesis. In 2008, it became the default at Google. Um, so it, it, it's really very mature but of course relatively new to the open source world. And so we're looking to rapidly mature it in the open source uh, environment into the, something that can provide that same productivity as it has at, at Google. So uh, our current release is version 0.4.1. We're not at 0.2 yet, right? <laughs> Um, and uh, what we've introduced in that release is the persistent Java compiler. So uh, Ulf was talking about the ability to maintain a persistent compiler in memory, and that makes your uh, uh, incremental builds much faster. Oh, look, now I'm repeating information. Um, we've introduced sandboxing for OS X. So sandboxing means that we won't rely on assets from the underlying operating system. And that's really important for our story around the repeatable, re reproducible build. So when I'm building something, my next door neighbor is building something, we want it to behave the same way for the same code base, uh, and, and even extending that to cross-platform builds. A couple things that are recent. Uh, one is uh, Windows. Uh, we've added support for Windows. You can build on Windows. Uh, we support Windows 7 plus 64-bit variants. Uh, relatively new, um, but maturing very rapidly. And the IDE support that, that Ulf mentioned. What we have is a framework for IDE support and then specific implementations for popular IDEs. We'd love to see that continue to grow. So what's coming next? Uh, in the next few versions, some, here are some of the highlights. Uh, we're going to keep working to mature Windows support. Um, there's still work to be done on OS X. We want to really and step up the mobile side of things. Again, you know, our goal here is to make it so that Bazel can be the only build system you need. And so therefore, we want to have really solid support across all the platforms. And Android and iOS uh, are supported by Bazel as of today, but there's work to be done there. Um, 
we're going to bundle the JRE in. So Bazel depends on Java. Um, and what that means is that to install it, you have to have a running JRE on your system. We're going to bundle that in, make it easier to install, easier to uh, port across systems. Um, we're adding support for code coverage. Um, and it, you run that locally, it spits out this really nice um, graphical report of how your coverage is. Some caching uh, things like uh, Ulf spoke about. And then the one that I think is the most exciting here is uh, fourth down. I should have put these in order. The searchable community repository of Skylark rules. So the idea that we want for Bazel is it's, it's not a C++ build system. It's not a Java, C, uh, Java build system. It's not a Fortran build system. It's all of them. And that's the, in, the impetus for Skylark, is that as the community of a given language, for example, Rust is a great example, where that community said, we want to make work for Bazel. They got together. You can go on GitHub and find a full set of Bazel rules. Uh, and you know, we certainly were aware of that. I, I, we may have helped them. I'm not sure. But this is something that they as a community were able to do with Bazel. Uh, and we want that to continue to grow and make it so that whether it's a new language you're creating, trying to support an older language. Bazel is the place to go. Bazel gives you all that plumbing, gives you the engine, and you write your rules to make it work. Uh, we had a, a great example. Uh, we were talking to someone earlier who uses a bunch of Java and a bunch of Fortran. And the beauty of, of Bazel is you can use both. Um, Java is supported out of the box. Fortran is something you can write rules for, and you're good. So then we get to Bazel 1.0. And Bazel 1.0 is not so much defined by features as it is defined by an approach to, to process. Uh, we're going to make GitHub be the primary core source for where everything happens. We really want to engage everyone. We need help here. Um, and we're going to have a, that formalized process for how the, the software is developed, um, which leads to being able to have a long-term support policy. Uh, so that we can communicate deprecations. Uh, we don't expect that Bazel is going to be uh, changing versions frequently. We want this to be a really solid platform upon which you can build those Skylark rules and iterate those at the speed that you need them. Then from there, we move on to Bazel 2.0, uh, which really is just the evolution of that Bazel vision. Uh, at that point, we want it to be completely language agnostic. So we're going to take those core rules. Right now, uh, some of the language have built-in rules. We're going to take those and move those out to Skylark, uh, make the core really small and, and, and performant so that everything happens through the extension framework. And these things can then mature at their own appropriate cadences. We want it to be big. We want Bazel to be widely used and loved. So uh, we hope everyone here will try it out, experience it, give us feedback, help it mature. And we want it to be fill in the blank. Uh, this is something that we as Google feel like it's important that we work with the community, evolve the state of the art of software development. So whatever it is that we as a community need from a, de a development tool, please, you know, the forums are open. Tell us what you're looking for. Propose changes. Um, and, and, and let's make this new approach to building software, the incremental, the parallelizable, something that supports huge code bases, huge teams, that supports the kind of software development that we do now. Let's keep it going with Bazel. So if you haven't tried it, what are you waiting for? Bazel.build has everything you need. You can uh, com uh, compile from source. Or if you're lazy like me, you can get the installers for, uh, for all the platforms. Great tutorials from uh, Hello World all the way up to complicated stuff. Um, and of course, you can grab uh, Skylark rules for any language that you're working on from GitHub. Uh, give us a star. We love positive reinforcement. And there's a public mailing list at uh, g.co slash basil discuss. So please join in, listen to the conversations, and uh, contribute.